The Iowa Hawkeyes falling on the road at one of the toughest venues in the country, 87-73 to 73 in West Lafayette. I'm Corey Bratta here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. You are watching Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close. And speaking of, well, let's not get rid of him. <laughs> speaking of Coach Gary Close, Gary, how you doing today? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. I got my ball cap on. I'm still, uh, I got my spirits together despite two very disappointing games today with the Iowa women falling uh, at number two, Indiana. And of course, uh, the Iowa men at number one, Purdue. First of all, kind of an odd day, not only because you have two games that are overlapping, but I would love to know when the last time the Iowa men and the Iowa women both played a top two ranked team on the road on the same night at the same time. Maybe never. Maybe never. And yeah. probably not both in the state of Indiana at the same time. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Very strange evening, and we've got a lot to get to uh want to thank our sponsors. First of all, you see Iowa floor covering up in our corner. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Brad Van Meter and his team down at State Farm. Talk about him all the time. But of course, as this season gets closer and closer to its finality, uh, be sure to consider giving Brad your support because, of course, if you've enjoyed the content all <laughs> year long, Brad is a big part of our efforts here at From the Hawkeye of the Storm in Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close. Give him a call for a free insurance quote, 515-256- 6480-515-256-6480 or online at www.bradbandmeter.com. Thank you to Brad and his team down at State Farm. All right, so we're going to, we, we usually break things down uh, before we get to our callers. So we do have a couple people waiting. I want to start with uh, the start of this game, Gary. Iowa coming out of the gates and really never recovering from the deficit that it dug itself early. And I didn't think the defense was great early. Obviously, Purdue is really good on both ends. I understand the challenge that comes with with collapsing down on Edie. Um, I did observe a couple times early uh, that Iowa got a little lazy on some some ball screens and tried to cheat, tried to go under, and they paid. What did you see early? Braden Smith was a big part of that as well. What did you see early from the Boilers? Yeah, he was he was terrific. Um, well, kind of what I expected. You know, they 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 had lost a tough game to their rival. Um, the previous game and they're coming home from a, you know, packed place, like you said, a tough place to play. And I, I figured, you know, that Purdue would be really ready to go and aggressive and, and hopefully we could just kind of withstand that deluge and not be too far, too far in the rear before we could, you know, mount some kind of a recovery. And unfortunately we probably got a little bit too far down, although, you know, there were some possessions in the second half where they could have really made it interesting with a basket. So I, I, I give Iowa a lot of credit for uh, a lot of teams would have been blown out of there and and called it a night. But they battled and and had a chance to really make it interesting. And that's a really good Purdue team that's um, tough to beat on their court. And, um, you know, they're probably going to win the Big Ten championship. And, and uh, they're good. They're well coached. And so I was impressed with how, how hard Iowa battled and um, Purdue played real well. So sometimes, you know, teams play well and, and you got to tip your hat to them and get ready for the next one. Just need to establish this right off the bat. Doesn't hurt you at all. No. no. And Gary, you, you've been a part of teams that are, are pretty good basketball teams. I consider Iowa a pretty good basketball team. They've won seven of their last nine. You've been a part of teams that just run into a buzzsaw at times. And yep. I'm sure I, when you go in and win every game, um, and I'm sure Iowa didn't have the mindset of, well, let's just see if we can keep it close. But in a sense, as you said, I think during our last show, your goal is to have a shot late. And right. they didn't have a shot in the last few possessions, but they did get it down to six late in the game. Do you take – I know there's no moral victories, but do you take some positives away from how Iowa fought in that second half? Absolutely. Um, you know, Purdue, Purdue, how many games has Purdue lost? You know, they've only lost two, and um, uh, they're um, – you know, they're a very talented team, especially on their court. 
and uh, and Iowa battled. And like we said, they had they had a couple chances there to cut it inside of six, maybe five with a three, and then it could have gotten real interesting. Their pressure was really good in the second half, calls Purdue all kinds of problems. Um, they got beat up on the boards, which which hurt. Um, probably the, the biggest stat in terms of where they lost the game and at least one of the areas, but I, I love the way they battled. Um, Chris Murray had a terrific game. I thought Patrick McCaffrey maybe had his best game since he's been absent. So that's encouraging. Uh, so, Hey, you learn from it. And then, um, you know, let's get ready for the next one and, and get another winning streak started. How, how much different is a loss like this? I mean, you're on the road and you're at, you know, number one in the country and you're into a raucous environment. Nobody expects you to win from a mora- team morale standpoint. Is it different than going on the road and losing to a, a team that's maybe very much beatable, if, if that makes sense? Does the team handle it different in your experience? Well, I think what you want to do is, you know, obviously you want to go in there and win, uh, but you want to go in there and compete for sure. And like you said, give yourself a chance. And I think, in that regard, you're playing the number one team on their court. They played well. It's not like they didn't play well. And um, you know, we had a shot. So I think I think that's got to be encouraging. Um, hey, you'd like to win. Uh, and, you know, a couple of best there, we really, it could have really been, became interesting. But, um, you know, the, the start hurt us. The rebounding hurt us a little bit. But uh, there wasn't a lack of effort or, or, or competition. They, they competed. So they keep playing like that. They'll get their fair share of wins. A little birdie told me before the game that, uh, and this is not my research, this was someone else's, but it's great research, and Purdue's losses slash close affairs. In other words, games they've won by one or two, maybe three points this season. Turnovers have been the common denominator in every single example. And so heading into this game, I tweeted out, Iowa's got to win the turnover battle. I think the only way they win this game is if they can win the turnover battle. I flash back to a game in West Lafayette. Yep. Last season, and Iowa did the exact same thing in the second half, Gary. Lots of forced turnovers through that press. And if you had told me heading into this game that final numbers-wise, Iowa would win the turnover battle 17-8, to eight, I-, I may say, hey, we might have won that game. Frankly, right. if you just look at that battle. Uh, I guess we can look at it from a couple different perspectives. Let's start with the, the press. Why is that press so effective against Purdue? Because, again, that was a really good team last year, too, in West Lafayette, and it got Iowa back in the game last year as well. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I like to go back and look at it. I, I thought they dribbled too much. And then they, you know, then you get into a problem with the 10 second count and now you're trying to force things. And I thought Iowa did a really good job of of containing the dribble. And so the 10 second count became, you know, became a, a, a problem. And then that led to uh, some questionable passes and some, and some good, uh, you know, anticipation plays by uh, the guys in the back of the back of the pressure. Um, it got Iowa back in the game. Uh, I don't think there's any question. That, that's about as effective as that's been all year. And I, I, I think it's um, – I think early they they beat it with the dribble, and then as the game went on, Iowa did a better and better job of containing that dribbler, and, and then that's where they got into trouble, and and uh, it was very effective. And he had 17-8 to eight turnover-wise. Gary, if you don't shoot 29% from the, the floor in the first half, they probably do have a shot at the end of this game. What, what, where do you, what do you attribute the struggles first half wise offensively to? Zach Eady. Uh, he really affects the game in a lot of ways. It's, it's amazing. Um, and he doesn't even have to block shots. You know, we, we probably had, I don't know, a half dozen point blank shots around that basket. We had some, you know, some pull ups that we were making games before that are just a little bit different. And, uh, yeah, it's not like he blocked a lot of shots, but he, he just, he's there. He's a big, big presence. And, you know, you're kind of looking over your shoulder and not finishing any, and he certainly had a few block shots, but I think defensively he, you know, the, the, with Phillip, you're not going to have an outside threat that can bring him out and make him guard on the perimeter. So he can hang in, clog up that paint. And I was good at attacking the basket and, and they weren't able to do that consistently because of his size. And, um, and a lot of times you can get good threes by attacking a basket. Purdue did that. Um, and so, uh, you know, our three, we didn't make, uh, I felt like we had to make at least 10 threes to offset his size inside. And of course we didn't do that. So um, I think, I think Edie, despite uh, not scoring a lot of points had a big impact on the game. 
Did you think Iowa's shot selection in that first half was maybe a little suspect? Yeah, there were a few that were, especially from three, I thought were a little quick and a little guarded and a little deep. I mean, there's some of them were two, three feet behind the, it's almost like they weren't sure exactly where they were on the court. Yeah, I know. I'd agree. I thought some of the shot selection was not good. And that's the hard thing about Peyton Sanford. I was thinking about that in the second half because, you know, he, he went through that huge lull to start the season and, you know, you and I both said, I mean, I think you maybe initially brought it up how his shot selection, you know, it kind of, uh, creates that snowball effect if you're struggling already because you're taking bad shots so it's hard to get the ball in to see the ball go through the rim to get that confidence going and he's obviously way well removed from that slump but I do feel like nights where he's not making it's frustrating watching him because he just takes a lot of shots that are like ooh, it just doesn't look yeah. like a good shot and he can make them Gary I know he can make them he's made a lot of them but yeah I mean, is that just is that just kind of how he is, and we just got to accept that's who Peyton Sanford is? Well, possibly. I, I'm hoping you know as he gets, you know, as he develops and gets, you know, gets more mature, he'll he'll do a better job of recognizing good and bad shots. It's it's um, especially early in the shot clock. Uh, when you do that, um, you know, you're not making the defense play any defense. And so you're not going to draw fouls. You're rarely going to get offensive rebounds. There's a lot of negative things that happen with quick shots. Your transition defense a lot of times gets affected by that. And so, you know, it's one thing if he's if he's on a roll maybe and he takes one of those. But I just thought especially early, a couple of those were questionable. And I, th I think as he gets older, hopefully he'll have a, do a little better job of recognizing, uh, you know, where we are in the possession, where we are in the game, how he's being guarded and be a little bit more selective in some of his shots. You don't want to lose his aggressiveness and his confidence, but um, I think he's got to be a little, little better at, at recognizing what a good and bad shot is. Before we get to our first caller, I want to give a shout out to Iowa Smokehouse. They're sponsoring the coverage here, Iowa post game from the Hawkeye of the storm. If you need good snacking and who doesn't this time of year with sports, out the wazoo, March Madness approaching. Of course, we've got the Super Bowl here in, in just a few days. Certainly give Iowa Smokehouse a chance and visit them online. You might not get your orders in time for the Super Bowl, but tons of great sporting events coming up. Again, March Madness being one. IowaSmokehouse.com. Use that code Hawkeye for 15% off your order. And keep in mind, $50 or more orders get free shipping. Again, IowaSmokehouse.com. They are an Iowa company, as is indicated in the name. Again, iowasmokehouse.com. All right, speaking of Iowa Smokehouse, let's go to our Iowa Smokehouse call-in line. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Gary Close. Who's on the line? Hi, Corey. Hi, Glenn. It's Mike. That's my I'm, sister. I'm the guy that called in complaining about the metrics and the defense after the Michigan State game. Yes. So – First of all, I'm not going to be that guy tonight. I've got a different perspective. Okay. I loved watching that basketball game tonight. What? Iowa played hard, and they kept coming. They were just beat by a better team. But yeah. I'm going to get more to the point, and this is kind of for Gary. Gary, I think Fran McCaffrey is a – NBA basketball coach trapped inside a college basketball coach's body. I, I could see Fran on the sideline of any NBA team coaching offensive geniuses to NBA championships. So my question is, A, were you ever asked to consider the NBA? Do you think Fran ever has been? I would suspect he has because his, I mean, that side of the ball is just, it's really impressive, especially in today's basketball, college basketball scene where grabbing and holding is just part of the game and his offensive teams flow and flourish, share the ball. So two questions. A, do you think, Fran has ever been asked to coach an NBA team and B, if he was, do you think he turned it down because of his family? 
And I guess I'll ask one more question. You wanna, I mean, you wanna... couldn't he coach? Couldn't he coach? Couldn't he coach NBA talent even better than college talent? Thanks, guys. I appreciate your coverage. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the call. Good question, Gary. That's hard yeah. to yeah an approached about, but uh... yeah, I, I you know obviously I don't have any idea. I, I wouldn't. I guess it wouldn't totally shock me if he had or not. He's you know he's been a successful coach, and um, I think he's the type of coach that would. Um, you know, in the NBA, it's, you know, it's handling all those egos. And I, I think he would be good at that. I think he's, I think people like playing for him. So I think in that regard, um, he could, he could probably be, um, you know, be an effective NBA coach, you know, as far as whether he would do it or not, I have, I have no idea. It's kind of a, you know, a lifestyle decision. I'm sure he enjoys coaching his kids and uh, that would be a factor, but um you know, he's had a terrific career at Iowa, and I, I you know, I, I think he could be an effective NBA coach. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen, but um, uh, a good question. And he was, I mean, our caller was impressed with the offense. Uh, I mentioned 29% in the first half, but there was a stretch there, first third of the second half. They were shooting 77%. Now, most of those came from inside the arc. They needed some threes to go down, and they made, I think, what, four in the second half, I believe. Um let me double check here. Yeah, four in the second half. So five of 18 overall. That's, you know, again, if you're 10 of eight, they can make four in the first half and you have eight, then you're, you're yeah, no, it's a game. Game. yeah, it's a game. And he's so big inside there. I think, I think teams that beat him are going to have to, are going to have to make threes. I don't, you're just not going to get a consistent attack around that basket with him in there and he doesn't foul. So it's, um, it's a real tough uh, team to score on around the, around the rim. And I appreciate our caller bringing up uh, Fran and maybe his potential to, to what he could do with NBA talent. Because, first of all, he has had NBA talent. I mean, I, I, Keegan is showing out right now in the NBA. Uh, Chris is uh, – I mean, he right now in all the mock drafts, he's a first-round draft pick. We'll see if that holds true. Um, I know that Luca and Tyler Cook and Joe Wieskamp have kind of – even Jared Utoff have kind of bounced around and haven't stuck. But – I want to come back to that here in a little bit because I do have a take on the the talent uh, topic with Fran that I think I think is has legs and should give fans real reason for optimism for the future with Fran McCaffrey. And speaking of that, I think our next caller here in the Iowa Smokehouse call in line might want to talk about this. Doug, hey, what's up, Corey? Doug, how are you? And the reason Doug. I think Doug wanted to talk about this, and, and maybe Doug, you can bring up the well, game. I messaged you. So. I mean, he brought up, yeah, he messaged me earlier and brought up uh, Iowa in the transfer portal and how much of a revelation Philip Rabracha has been and what will Iowa do this coming summer in the portal. Doug, do you want to start with well, that? or the game? I have another question because of the last caller uh, about Coach's career. Were you a candidate in 08 when Keno left for Providence for the Drake Hay coaching job? Did you interview for that or anything? I did. I did. How close were you to getting that? Do you don't know? That's a good, that's a good question. <laughs> um, that guy was say, not the right fit. I'll I would say fairly, fairly close. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. was that one of the few? Because um, I know uh, Jess Settles uh, recommended you for that job, and quite a few other people did. And I thought you'd be a great fit to take over for Keno. Um, was there other – jobs like that the i know you said that you had a d3 job offer and that's when you decided to go up to wisconsin was there other jobs like that yeah the d3 offer came in between uh uh iowa and um and wisconsin yeah i had several division one interviews that never quite broke the door down so to speak but you know pretty much all over the all over the country uh so um you know, it's one of the things where, you know, timing's everything in the right place at the right time. And, and unfortunately that never quite happened, but um, the good news is I, I had an opportunity to coach at two great schools. So that was, mm. you know, it wasn't, you know, it was okay. Uh, I would like to have been head coach, but I certainly really appreciate the two jobs I had. Well, if you would have taken that job, you wouldn't have gotten uh, to coach Sam Decker and uh, Frank and all those guys. And, you know, yep. God has his plan, I guess. Yep. Um, exactly. Going back to what Corey was saying, I, uh, I I watched a lot of mid-major basketball myself, you know, Drake, North Dakota, North Dakota State. And one of the things I'm starting to do now 
is scout. <laughs> I'm going to go and that's the guy I want on our team. Um, do you think coaches are doing that now with the transfer portal? Uh, I, I know you talked about Brad with the uh, swarm. Uh, what can't, it's not like high school or junior college recruiting. Obviously we can't talk to them, but do you think coaches are doing that now? And should we be doing that? Um, I mean, I don't want to be plucking North Dakota State's players or mm-hmm. interfering with their season, but other teams I think are doing that. I would think that they there there probably is some some of that. Uh, you know, the season is is really hectic, you know, and and trying to prepare for you know every opponent that comes up pretty quickly, and to, you know continue to recruit um, underclassmen in high school. But I would I wouldn't be surprised if they're trying to keep an eye on you know, who's the leading scorer in this league and that league and and maybe watching a little bit of tape just in case something were to happen. I I, I, get, I, I wouldn't be surprised if if that happens. The problem is, do you have enough time to do it? I mean, it's mm-hmm. the season is uh, really, really hectic in terms of preparation uh, for games. And then usually when you're not doing that, you're on the road recruiting somewhere. And so it's just a question of time where they have enough to to do that, maybe they've got some other people in the office that are doing that, just kind of keeping track of of who, who's playing well and where in case something like that were to happen. Kind of like kind of like what you do, what would do, you know, in the NFL if you're a professional coach and you're trying to keep track of who's doing well in college. So, I would guess that's probably happening to some degree. Yeah, that kid uh, Grant Nelson up in North Dakota State. Have you have you watched him, Gary? No, I haven't. No. He's he's something. He's six eleven. Uh, he's rangy, not real big. I mean, he's he's. I think maybe the, the question phys- is physically mm-hmm. uh, would he translate over Doug to the Big Ten and yeah. certainly the NBA because he's he's special. And I would not be surprised if he enters the portal and is looking for greener pastures. But I mean, he's putting up the numbers he, so far at that level. He's no offense to Philip Robracha, but he's going to make pop more eyeballs. Uh, hmm. Then Philip Robracha did it. Where is he from? He's at North Dakota State. I know. Where is he from? Where 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 did he go to high school? North Dakota. North Dakota. He was He was from North Dakota. Yeah, that's just why I wasn't recruited. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, All unless right. Jepson was, but like, not a lot of North Dakota kids are recruited. Yeah, can you, yeah. Gary, maybe Je- maybe Les can. You never know. There. Maybe he could put in a good word for us. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. So, anyways. Uh, but this is what I was going to say earlier, Doug. And since you're on the phone, you brought this up. I'll, I'll bring it up. Um, <laughs> did you watch our show with uh, Iowa Swarm leader Brad Heinrichs? Part of it. Okay. So, and I'll have to go back and watch that again. The segment we talked exclusively about basketball. But I'm just telling you, folks, Iowa has been. I mean, just look at the history of uh, Iowa basketball under Fran McCaffrey. How many times? We all know this. How many times has Iowa been really, really close to landing a high four or five star kid? I mean, they. They have had, whether we're talking Tyler Eulis, Trace Jackson, I don't know if the Trace Jackson Davis, how close they were. They were probably top three or four. Keon Brooks and ended up going to Kentucky. Um, I mean, right now they're on, in on Donnie Freeman, who's a high four. They, they've had an opportunity to land some of the best players in the country. Fran has not lost out on players due to effort. And yeah. oftentimes it's been a blue blood that's come in and, and found a way to snag these guys. The reason I bring it up is, just talking with Brad Heinrichs, and I have reason to believe Brad's being 100% truthful, and you can see some of the results now. They're able to land some bigger names in the transfer portal uh, for college, for, for, for football. Um, we're seeing a different level of NIL opportunity than we had, not even close to what we had a year ago. I think the Swarm Collective is so much, so far beyond what it was last summer. And so what, the reason I bring that up is I think they're going to have an opportunity, even though I know we don't like the idea of buying players. They lost some players last year, not only in the recruiting circuit, but also on the transfer portal, in the transfer portal uh, cycle due to NIL. And they are so far beyond the struggles that they were dealing with at that point with this collective. I'm not saying they're, you know, they're top of the Big Ten, but it, what Brad said is he believes they're solidly upper tier of the Big Ten. And I just think with how close Fran has been from the high school ranks and with some of these guys like Trey Mitchell, who they recruited in the portal last year, the kid who ended up going to Akuba, Theo Akuba, um, obviously the, the Fardaz Amac, who's been out almost all year due to injury at Texas Tech. I just would think if there's going to be 
something that pushes Iowa over the hump and gets Fran over the hump with one of those battles for a marquee guy and perhaps it's in the portal, it might be the NIL dollars that are now available that weren't available last year. Gary, do you have thoughts on that? I know it's a totally different era of recruiting with on an NIL. I would, I would guess so. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, if you, you're in on somebody with a couple other schools and they're, they're looking at the pluses and minuses of all the programs and okay, well, what can you, I mean, this day and age, what, what, what's, what's available there and you can compete there just like you can compete with facilities or quality of education or whatever a young man's looking for, then yes, I think, I think, I think they got to, that's, that's the way the game is now. They got to continue to, to work on that and improve that and, and be competitive. And it sounds like uh, they're going in the right direction. And I guess what I'm saying in all this, Doug, is yeah. I am excited to see what Iowa can do in this next transfer portal cycle because of the NIL dollars and because Fran showed a willingness last year to go to the portal. They just yeah. didn't have the, the resources in place yet. Well, I, I want to talk about Purdue for a second before I leave. Uh, just one thing I want people to realize – Purdue hasn't been to the Final Four since 1980 and played against us in a third-place game. Uh, I cannot believe Gene Cady or Matt Painter haven't taken them to the Final Four. So think about that program and all the success they've had with Gene Cady and Matt Painter. I was wondering what coaches' thought thoughts were on – I know Smith lit it up today. What are your thoughts on this team, uh, the Purdue team, going to the Final Four or even winning it all? I like the Purdue team. Um, now they got freshman guards that have, you know, when you get into the NCAA tournament, that's a that's a totally different animal. But I've liked them all along. I think they um, they're well coached, physical. Uh, they can they're capable of of shooting well from three, so that people can't just drape all over Edie. I think Edie is a game changer. Uh, so I think they've got a great great shot. Um, you know, having been in the NCAA tournament, it's there, there's some luck involved. Uh, it's, it's hard to win in advance. It's just, a, it's a bear, you know, it's a one shot deal. You just get one off night, you're done. And, um, so it's, it's tough. And there's a good example of how tough it is. And all the great Purdue teams that have, that we've watched over the last 30, 40 years and not one team has made it to the final four. That's pretty surprising, but I think it tells you just how difficult it is to get there. What would you say if I told you they had, Again, 17 Purdue turnovers, but just 14 points scored off the turnover, turnovers. Is that a low number for you? Uh, maybe a little bit, but, you know, they, you know, if you have a 10-second count, you're not going to be able to convert that. If they throw the thing out of bounds, you're not going to be able to convert that. And I think they had a, they had a few of those uh, that were a part of those turnovers. So, um, But, boy, any way you can turn them over, that's great. Uh, that's, that's, that's impressive. I, I – uh, the press was really effective. I think it was effective not only in, in turnovers, but in some cases it, it even got them a little out of sync offensively. Not a lot, but you know, there were a few shots that were a little questionable. Um, and a few times they run down there and, and shot quickly and didn't get the ball to Edie. So uh, it was very effective. And again, Iowa scored 21 points in the first half, 52 in the second against a really good defensive team. And I'm telling you, I know it doesn't matter now, but if they, uh, if they just shoot halfway decent, if they can just shoot high 30s, 40% from the field in that first half, they're in this thing at the end, Gary. Yeah. And um, just, you know, that's it's hard to shoot on the road, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, it can be. That's for sure. Especially a place like that and, and their length. It just, um, you know, if you look back on it, there weren't a ton of wide open shots that they missed. There were a few. And there are a few shots around the rim they'd probably like to get back. But like we said, I think Edie is he is a force in there, not even having to block any shots, just being there. It just, it just changes how teams shoot the ball. And, and I think it definitely affected Iowa tonight. Bryce in our uh, live chat says, one foul on Purdue in the first half. He's right. One foul call on Purdue in the first half. They do defend without fouling. Do you think the officiating was okay? I did. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a problem with officiating. There was one call in the second half. I thought Edie was clearly not vertical, and they call, they I think they uh, called it a clean block, or I don't think they called it, I don't think they called anything. Um, but yeah, they, they do. I mean, P Painter, Matt Painter, uh, you you coached against him, obviously. What does mm -hmm. he do so well to keep his guys locked in defensively? Well, it's kind of been Purdue's tradition for a long, long time. You know, he he played 
uh, under a very good defensive coach in Gene Cady. And, and uh, so he was well-schooled as far as that goes. Um, so I think it's, I think it's been a part of his program for a long time. I think he, he teaches it well and, and he's got some, you know, like anything offensively or defensively, the more you, you know, the more talent you've got, it makes things a little easier at both ends. And he's got some talent. Circle Irk says the only thing that make him feel better right now is if you fire up them birds, Gary. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> if right. I did, well, I would. <laughs> we'll have to save that for an NCAA tournament loss. Hopefully you, you don't have to deal with that this year, nah. but we'll save that for a tournament loss. Uh, right. Okay, let's let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call-in line. You want to guess who it is, Gary? It's Ryan. He's got – I'm sure hey. <laughs> Ryan has something to say. Just get the Courtney Green comments out of the way now, Ryan. I saw Ryan at Car Rock Guy Arena the other day. Did you really? Yep. Hey, Coach. Thank you very much for uh, saying hello. And uh, my knees are shaking a bit. But uh, I just think it's awesome that it's been, what, 23 years since you coached here and you still come back. And uh, you're a Hawkeye, you know, and – I always hated seeing you on the Wisconsin bench. Because like, <laughs> to I, me, I had to pay the bills. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. It's just, uh, you know, Wisconsin to me is the St. Louis Cardinals of this Cubs fan. You respect okay. them. You respect them because they're better than you. Even though, even though. When you joined the Big Ten in 1986, Wisconsin was fighting Northwestern as the armpit of the Big Ten at the time. And uh, Dick Bennett and Bo Ryan, you know, we know how that all turned out. Anyway, Coach, it was awesome meeting you. You bet. Thank thank you very much. I'm just glad that this meeting occurred. (laughs) I'm just so happy this meeting occurred. It was so weird because, like, he didn't sit too far from me and I look over and I see coach close. And so I just decided to come over and say hello. Absolutely. It was nice of you. And did, what you, a did, you have to, did you have to wait in a long line? No, nope. actually it was only three people, but I just <laughs> covered back. My mother-in-law, they, my father-in-law, and my, and my daughter. <laughs> I was going to say Jess is maybe the third one, but anyways. No, Jess wasn't there because, okay. uh, you know, I would have probably marked out there too. But, uh, again, you know, Coach, you're a Hawkeye. We know it. <laughs> and uh, it was just really cool seeing you back back home. As far it's as – It's the- fun to go to Carver. I, I, I enjoy it. And it's, it's amazing. Each time I go, I, I see – I see former players and former people that were part of the program. It's it's been fun. Hey, uh, understand. As far as the game goes, um, you know, I'm proud of the effort. And my only referee complaint, if you will, I know that's kind of what you are waiting for, is one foul, Zach Eady, in the first half. I mean, I could have counted four or five. Not that it was egregious, but one foul was pretty ridiculous. I guess, you know, you say they let them play. Fine. Um, My question for you, Coach Close, on the X's and O's is, it seemed to me like we made it a major priority to limit Edie as much as you could. And I can't disagree with that because then you're, you know, basically saying beat us with the 37% shot, the three pointer. And they did flat out. And I'm not even arguing because Edie can't score 35 on us the way Big Ten teams like Garza do many times, you know. So we decided to, I think, bank on the three-point shot. My question for you, though, and what scares the daylights out of me and our (coughs) potential this year is this is – and I'm not talking about just this year. I'm talking about 
five years plus. It seems like we give up an awful lot of open threes. And if they make three of them, that's nine points. That's going to burn you and probably beat you. And I'm not criticizing the Iowa defense. I'm not criticizing 87 points, but I'm not criticizing the approach. But I think we are terrible at perimeter defense. It seems like there's a lot of zone collapsing down on the paint where they kick out and we're done. And well, what, so, what are you supposed to, what are you supposed to do against Zach Eady? I'm just curious, Ryan. I agree. I mean, I it's, mean, it's a hard night to complain about that. I, I thought early. I, I, wait, getting... wait, Corey, Corey, one second. I am not complaining. I'm asking coach closest opinion. Um, I, I generally do like the game plan. I do. And it's not so much about this game. It's about a lot of games where we tend to collapse into the paint and they kick out and there's not a guy to defend within the zip code. And so that's kind of more where I'm going. I'm not complaining about tonight. The better team won. It had nothing to do with referees or anything else. And I don't think we embarrassed ourselves either. I do think, and Corey, you may have seen this. We're now what seven and one against the upper tier teams, and like zero and five against the lower tier teams. Yeah, there's such a fine line though between the. I mean, like Ohio State and Michigan are. I think they're pretty good basketball teams. They just somebody's got to lose more than they win. And I, I, you, I know you're right though. Now. Here's the loss that will be damaging is if they lose Sunday to Minnesota. I don't care if it's on the road or not. That's going to be a bad loss. They got to Won't win. happen. Won't happen. Okay, good. I don't want Hopefully it to happen. Hopefully, Stanford <laughs> makes some better shots. Because yes. I thought that was a really tough night. Patrick looked pretty, you know, like he's getting there. Um, Gary, did you have some thoughts on, on Ryan's question? As far as the three point defense? Yeah. Well, obviously, when you when you're you know when you're trying to double team him, and he's a pretty good passer. In fact, the whole team's pretty good, pretty good passing team. You're going to get some open looks. I, I thought there were a few that they could have covered better. Um, a couple of, you mentioned, of course, a couple of ball screens that it, that they went under that they hit that were probably a mistake. A couple of times where they were over helping uh, to where they were just too far away to get back in time. To bother shooters so but it, it's a it's a it's a fine line it's it's a tough you know it's a tough way to play and that's that's what Edie does to your to your team I thought the other thing is they I, they, they give them all layups which was you know that's where, where you get spread out and, uh, and I that's I thought that hurt them almost as much as the threes um a lot of dribble penetration that got to the rim I think I had him for 10 layups in the second half alone um which which is too many uh, so, uh, you know, there were, there were, there were possessions where they battled and played pretty well defensively. And there were other ones where they weren't, but part of that's Purdue. Purdue's good. I mean, they're, they're a hard team to guard and, and, um, they get beat you in a lot of ways. So it puts a lot of pressure on your defense. Ryan, uh, appreciate you calling in and, uh, you ever see all me? I'm, all I want to say is the second I was knocked out of the big 10 or uh, NCAA tournament, I'm going to root for Purdue. I think Matt Painter is an amazing coach. And, you know, he he, he uh, wore the Chris Street pen when he uh, kicked our butt on the 25th game. But uh, he's a really good dude. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't know where he gets these Yao Mings. I thought, I thought we were, you know, seven footers year after year and now he's getting seven four <laughs> i don't <laughs> get it but um best of luck to purdue the rest of the way i hope they i hope they run the table if we can appreciate Which it Ryan. we probably won't. Right. good to see you ryan thank Thanks, you sir. guys and they deserve a lot of credit for developing him i mean it's not like he walked in there as some great player he 
it took a lot of work to, to uh, and I'm certainly I'm sure on his part as well, but the coaching staff to get that kid where he is right now. And um, I just can't believe that kid's not going to get drafted. I, I, if I were an NBA team, I would take a flyer on him. Can't shoot, Gary. I, his free throw stroke looks great. Well, I, 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 it's it's free, not like okay, but how many guys are? I'm just saying, how many how many bigs in the NBA can't shoot? Uh, can't, well, there's can't. not many, but I'll tell you what, I I I I take him and see if I can turn him into a shooter. I, I think he's got potential. Yeah, there's not many guys seven four. Uh, that's no. and he's he's, he's, he's you know that. it's amazing though. You're absolutely right. If if he was playing in the in college twenty years ago, he'd be. He'd probably be the number one guy taken, yeah. frankly, uh, because he he has a lot of Yao Ming in him. I mean, he's got some really nice touch. It's amazing. You, you know, I grew up with watching Yao Ming basketball, and I mm-hmm. always failed to appreciate him because he wasn't just your typical seven five seven six guy. He had unbelievable skill from yeah. places on the court, and yeah. obviously injury ridden and, and career cut far too short, but uh, Zach eady has got some of that in him. And uh, yeah, it's going to be hard for teams in the NCAA tournament, unless you can spread them out and make threes. Um, but of course, then you look at the other side, how do you defend that? You're going to have to hope that they miss threes, right? And that's kind of yeah. what we were looking Bill said when we were at recent show, you got to collapse down on, they did that. And I thought it worked in the second half for the most part, but I just, when you collapse down, when you, when you, we use the term collapse down, Gary, can you give our listeners an idea of what that means? Because if you're sending a double team on Zach Eady, that doesn't just mean that guys should be able to sit out there for completely uncontested shots. You should be able to rotate and communicate. And I know it's hard, but talk about what that means out of a double team. Well, I mean, you know, a lot of people do it different ways. You know, some people will designate a double double team guy. Some will, you know, the closest guy will go get him. I thought at times they had two or, you know, three or four guys around it, which they didn't need to do. And that left some three point shooters open. I think the other thing is when you're, when you're, when you're collapsing, it's important that you keep your back to the baseline. If you turn all the way around and face the guy that you're collapsing on, then you're going to be slower going back out again. Uh, So you can still put, put pressure and and be a, a defensive factor getting off your guy and getting close to a guy in the paint, but still be in position where you can recover, you know, when the ball goes out and you got to recover as soon as that ball leaves the guy's hands, you can't wait until the ball gets there and then go. It's that, that's going to be too late. So it's a hard thing to teach, especially if you don't do it all the time. And that's why, you know, playing Purdue where it's such a big part of, of your defensive strategy they're they're tough to prepare for. Are you surprised at all? Maybe this is a dumb question to you, Gary. And if it is, just you can tell me it's a dumb question. Were you surprised? <laughs> were you surprised that uh, when they had Josh Agundale in the game, that they still doubled every time? No, I think that was their strategy going in. Uh, that they were going to double team. They probably worked on it, and um, it wasn't like uh, you know, Josh. I don't, I don't think Josh could have guarded him one on one. And I think that that's what they figured. That none of them could guard him one on one. So. Um, you know, they were committed to doing that and, and, and it was effective in controlling him. It wasn't as effective controlling the threes. And I even think some of the dribble penetration, it's hard to close out and then guard somebody that's putting the ball on the floor. It's a, it's a hard, maybe the hardest defensive thing to do is to close out and then guard somebody that can shot fake and put it on the, put it on the deck. And I thought at times, um, they got free on some of those plays and, you know, got, got wide open layups. Key moment in this game, Iowa had cut the lead to, to six. And you mentioned Zach Eady being really quiet. Of course, he affects the games in, in so many ways. And yes. you know, a lot of those points in, in the first half were <laughs> you got to give half of that credit to, to Zach Eady, whether he was the assist man or not. Um, mm-hmm. But in that second half, Iowa had cut it to six and Zach Eady gets to his spot twice in a row. And that just kind of felt like that was that was it, right? Iowa needed to take advantage of the run that they had put together and got the, you know, Zach Eady got the crowd back going, pushed it back to double figures. And I think there is probably something to be said about, you know, when you cut it under double figures, that kind of gives you life. Doesn't it, Gary? Is there some sure. kind of almost a psychological thing there? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. You're now you're, now you're within shouting distance. You know, you get, you get a couple more baskets, get a three, get a turnover. All of a sudden now it's down to a couple possession game and, Hey, let's let's go. That's exactly where we want to be. 
Before we get to our next caller, I want to give a shout out to Iowa Smokehouse and their awesome <laughs> products. They've got uh, ketchups, barbecue sauces, all kinds of great uh, products. And of course, you can find them in your local grocers. But check out this, this promo code. You'll get 15% off by using the code Hawkeye. This is a, a courtesy of not only Iowa Smokehouse, but here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Visit iowasmokehouse.com. Again, ketchups, barbecue sauces, beef jerky, meat sticks, steak bites. I've been munching on some steak bites here before we went live. Tasting is believing. And again, with a $50 or more order, you get free shipping courtesy of Iowa Smokehouse down in Albia. All right, let's get to our next caller who's been waiting patiently on the phone line. Thank you for calling the Iowa Smokehouse call-in line. Who's on the line? Good evening, gentlemen. This is John. Hey, John. Hi, uh, John. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to tread on sacred ground, so I'm going to do it lightly. Um, <laughs> is Peyton Sanford to this team what Chris Street was to his team? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, they're, they're they're different players. Um, Chris was more of an inside um, player, rebounder, uh, things like that. Whereas Peyton's, um, you know, more of an outside threat. But I, I, I do think he brings a lot of the energy and enthusiasm for the game that that Chris had. Um, you watch him on the bench; he's he's in the game. He's up. He's cheering. He's very active, um, and that's why you like having him on your team. So I think in that regard, they are very similar, although they play different uh, different. Um, positions but um uh I, I like his energy and his intensity and it's obvious in watching him that he loves to play the game and that's that's good i mean that that's that's uh that bodes well for his development and, and future Corey, can i ask a women's basketball question sure uh northwestern we're up about 40 points. Caitlin clark's still in the game in the fourth quarter uh penn state we're up over 40 and the starters are in the in the fourth quarter. Should they be? Don't get me started on that. I have a very strong opinion on that, Gary. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll let you take it. <laughs> well, I, well <laughs> you you may not. You, do you call uh, John? Do you know? Have you heard me sound off on that? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Well, consider yourself fortunate. I, I think it's a. I think it's a real uh, shame that Lisa Bluter keeps Caitlin Clark in the game in those situations. Just my opinion. And and Lisa Bluter doesn't agree. I mean, she was asked directly about that several weeks back, and she said, well, triple doubles are real special. Okay, you're up 40, and you've got the best player in the world, the best player in the college basketball world, and you're willing to risk injury so she can pad her triple double stats? I think it's ridiculous. You may have a totally different take on that, Gary, but Lisa has basically said she's not worried about it. She even used the illustration, well, there's risk in everything. There's risk when you walk into a restaurant. I just don't agree with that. I respect Lisa Bluter as a person. He's a great person and, and a good coach, but I don't agree with that at all. Your thoughts, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get a pass on You're this. You're going to stick me out there. Absolutely. I, 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 w I wouldn't do it either. I, I, I take him out. Yeah. yeah so what, what is this thing? So I, I just, is it, is it chasing John? Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about, right? Lisa has talked about this. I haven't heard her say anything about it. I, okay. I'm just sitting there watching the games thinking, you know, what, what, what if she tears an ACL or sprains a knee or an ankle and, and we lose her for the season or six to eight weeks? Is it really? I know she's doing it probably for player of the year to keep her in player of the year. I but think that's it. Well, that, but see, that doesn't give it any more validity because what are we here for? Are we here for individual success or are we here for team success? I, I just, I don't get that, but you know, she's the head coach. Yeah. Well, I don't get it either. I thought maybe it was just me. So no, no, it's not just you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks for the call, John. Yeah, I'm surprised he brought that. I thought he was trying to get my goat because that is one thing I feel very strongly about that's bothered me. Because they let's give Iowa women credit; they have had a lot of blowouts, and you know this idea of chasing triple doubles because they're special. I mean, who cares? I, I know I'm not. I'm not in Caitlin Clark's shoes. I'm not in the. And it does. Here's the one thing it does do, and I'm not defending her doing this by means of this reasoning, but I do think when you get more triple doubles and when your your players win 
national awards, it does help you recruiting wise, right? Because it gains more attention for your program and more notoriety. Is that no fair, Gary? And it's more attention for women's basketball and more Absolutely. attention. For Iowa. There's no that's, doubt. And that's, and I'm sure that's part of it. Uh, Cause they've got to fight for every uh, bit of recognition they can get. They just don't get the exposure that the men do. And uh, it's a shame because that's a really good player and a real good basketball team, but that's just the way it is. So I think that's, that's got something to do with it for sure. But you know what I think would be even better exposure than bunches of triple doubles and individual awards would be if Iowa can go win a national championship with Caitlin Clark. No doubt. And if she blows out her knee in the last two minutes of a game because you've kept her in when you're up 40, uh, guess what? You're not winning a national championship. <laughs> you can guarantee no, that. No, you're, you're probably not advancing very far at all. No. Gary, what would you think of Josh Agundale tonight? He wasn't in there a whole uh, much to really – really make a, make a choice. So it was okay. I mean, it didn't, it didn't stand out in either direction, but I was surprised. So he's, he's, he's obviously gotten some practice time and got a chance to get his legs underneath him a little bit. I thought he competed. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's anything real bad or real good, but um, you know, I didn't, didn't get a whole lot of time, but when he was in there, he was fine. All right, let's go to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Let's go to Jared, the actor. How are you, Jared? Hey, Corey, doing good. How are you guys doing? Good, Jared. Hanging in there. Good. Yeah, so I it was kind of um, coming in this game with um, limited expectations, and it turned out somewhat the way I expected. Um, but I just want to ask a few questions in terms of uh, personnel. And you guys alluded to this uh, a, a few minutes ago here, but you know they brought in Josh Agumbale to try and combat um, – you know, the, the powerhouse that is Zach Eady. Do you think that was a good move? And do you think that was, they should have stuck with him longer? Um, I, I thought it was effective. I thought, like we had talked about, I thought he was fine. I don't think it was anything great or anything real bad. Um, I think they're going to play Phillip as many minutes as he can handle um, for other reasons. In addition to, uh, I mean, I thought he was competitive guarding him as well. So um I think Josh is going to have to show a lot more to get extended minutes just because Phillip is, is too valuable to have out on the court. Do you feel like that was a gimmick by Fran to just to put a, a bigger body in there? Um, no, I don't know if it was a gimmick. I think, I think he had to decide, okay, who am I going to play when I got to give Phillip a blow? You know, you're battling that guy all night long. That's going to, that's going to tax you a little bit. And, um, and so I think he felt that, um, you know, maybe his size and bulk would be a little bit better. Um, he needed somebody to give him, get, to give him some, some minutes, give him a break. And, and, uh, like I said, I thought he was, I thought he was fine. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Another thing that I you know was going to see if you guys agreed with, but you know, in the first half, particularly in the first, you know, eight, 10 minutes, I, I felt like they were, the team itself was intimidated and somewhat scared to go in the lane and try and, you know, push shots against, um, you know, that, that home court advantage and, and that number one team in the country. Yeah. I, I, I didn't think that's easy. I think he, uh, he just, his size just, just completely um, can dominate a game in terms of feeling comfortable and effective in there. He's, he is a handful Um you know, the few times they got in there, it looked like they rushed them a little bit. You know, Tony had been terrific. The, those little pull-up jumpers in the last game, and those were a little bit off because he had to arc them up a little bit higher. Um, I don't even know how many block shots he had. I don't think he had a ton. But he changed a lot of shots in there, um, and most of them were misses. Yeah, he, yeah, had, I just, he had five block shots, by the way. He had five blocks to go along with well. Yeah. I just felt for me, you know, that, that was the first time Iowa had to play against a guy like that. Yeah. And I, the, the team offensively, which, which, you know, throughout the season has looked really good at times, mm -hmm. were very intimidated and they felt like, you know, they, they couldn't really get inside, you know, the, the, the lane at all without um, that guy jumping up and blocking them. Yep. No, I agree totally. And, and I felt going in, they'd have to make at least 10 threes offset that and of course they didn't and i think if they had it might have even opened up even more driving lanes you know to get them extended out a little bit more but they just didn't make enough to to really make them 
warrant coming out any farther than they had to. And, and, um, and I think that was a, uh, a big part of them not scoring like they normally do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, overall, you know, they, they kind of, well, they cut it to six in the second half. So they, they mm-hmm. at least kind of made it a game, you know, worth watching. So that was good to see. And so my last question is, you know, I, I think there's seven games left and the, the schedule's somewhat of a mix, but if, if Corey, can I get your prediction on the last seven games, uh, win loss wise? Uh, well, let's see. I'm trying to think who they play. They get Michigan state, Ohio state, Nebraska at home. I think you go at least two out of three on those three teams. I mean, maybe lose to me. I think they win all three of those. Yeah. I think they got a, yeah, I think they got a good shot of that as well. So they get Minnesota Sunday, that's four wins, three or four wins. Um, they get Northwestern on the road. That'll be tough. Um, trying to think what's the other game am I missing? I'm missing they call it Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So yeah, I mean, I mean, Wisconsin's not your typical Wisconsin, Gary. You you know that uh, they've lost some at home. That the Cole Center has not been uh, murdered. Oh, it has. They've games. actually played better on the road. Um, and they yeah. have it at home. I believe they have. They're going to their- yeah, be a very desperate team. Uh, so you know you're going to get a great effort because they're like several teams in the Big Ten. They are they are right on the bubble. So they need they need wins. That'll be a big game for them. Um, be a big game for Iowa too, but. Um, that will be a that'll be a gigantic game. Uh, Did they play Indiana one more time. Yeah, they play Indiana in, the, in Assembly Hall. And that's at Indiana. Yeah, that, that'll that'll be difficult. Indiana's I'll, a lot better. I'll say we have seven. You said seven games left. Is that right, Jared? Yes. Okay. Seven games left. I think safely, I'll say they're going to go uh, four and three um, at best. Maybe six and one. So maybe maybe split the difference. Uh, maybe five and five and two. And so, what, what do you think? What do they, you know? I think that gets them in the tournament, correct? And and oh, if so, yeah. what what they does... would have to, they would have to lose some game. Like uh, some, the, the game on Sunday is actually a more pressure, a bigger game than this game. From a, I mean, obviously you could have built your resume by winning tonight, but you do not want to lose Sunday to Minnesota because they're they're. Gary, I said a few weeks ago, I said way looking, Bill. I said Minnesota's bad, and he said, well, I don't, I don't think they're that. They're bad, Gary. They're <laughs> the basketball team right now. Well, they've lost some players too. Yeah, yeah. they're they're struggling. That place can be a little crazy, but it, uh, there there's no doubt that they 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 should and and have to win that game. So, Jared, right now, lenardi has got Iowa as a six seed. I've looked at some other bracketologists; they've got Iowa in the six to seven range. They're not going to drop based on this loss tonight. So, you're probably looking if they hold serve and go four and three with you know they don't lose at home to Nebraska and on the road to Minnesota. I think you're probably going to be at least a seven. That'd be my prediction. If they can steal that game at Indiana uh, and take care of business and maybe steal one at Northwestern, boy, uh, say they somehow won out. I know that's way jumping the gun. I, I'm guessing you could climb to a, a five. I don't know that you can get to a four, Gary, and I know we're not bracketologists. If they won out and won all seven games? Won out right now with a win at Indiana and a win at Wisconsin and a win at Northwestern. You think you can climb to a four? Yeah. Yeah. There, there you go, Jared. Bracketology. Yeah, well, you know, I look look for your expertise, guys. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Jared. Uh, yeah, thanks for the call. See you, Jared. Absolutely. All right, we're wrapping this up. We've got uh, two people. We're going to kind of have to speed these up to an extent here. We're uh, we're running out of time here. I uh, do want to thank Brad Van Meter and his team down at State Farm. Talk about him. Uh, pretty much every show. And uh, if you haven't called Brad for a quote, what are you waiting for? He's got Great people doing great things in the insurance world, and they've been in business since 1999. They're offering services across the state of Iowa, auto, home, renters, business, life insurance. They spend countless hours every year reviewing coverages and making any needed changes. They're celebrating, of course, State Farm uh, is the biggest auto insurance company in the uh, nation, and they're celebrating their 100th year of being in business. So just great, great opportunity to save money and get great insurance coverage through Brad Van Meter and his team down in Des Moines. Visit him online at bradvanmeter.com or call him 515-256-6480. All right, let's go to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Gary Close, who's on the line. Hello, you're on the air. Uh-oh. Can you hear us? Yeah, this is Jay. I uh, just want to ask Coach Close, uh, why do they have um, Chris throwing the ball uh, every time? 
seemed to me like he'd be a lot more effective if he was down there on the post. Um, Throwing the ball on the out of bounds place. Where does he? I'm not sure where he means. Can you hear his caller? Yes, this is Jason. Are you talking, yeah, Jason? Are you talking about out of bounds plays or where? You, what exactly are you referring out of bounds? Play. It's like after a made basket by the other team. Okay. Oh, inbounding the ball. Yeah. Yes, I sir. think I, I don't know this for sure, but my guess is is that um, the, uh, as a pure guess is that I think that um, whatever big is closest to the ball. Uh, they're instructed to get in and get it going. They they want to get that ball in and get the break going. And so, you know, a lot of times Chris is there because he's, you know, he, he's an inside player. So he's around the basket a lot. Um, so I'm guessing that might have something to do with it. If it's a, uh, you know, because a lot of times when it's a, they have to get it in, they'll put Connor in there because he's such a good passer. But I think in a, in a made basket open court situation, I'm guessing it's whoever's closest grabs it and, and, and off they go and, and uh, because he's around the basket a lot, it's probably either he or Philip that are initiating it. Did you catch that caller? Yep. Very good. Thank you. Have Thank a good you, one. Sir. Appreciate All it. Right. All right. Let's get to our next caller. Thank you for calling Iowa Ooh. Smokehouse. Call in line. Who's on the line? Hey, Corey and Gear. It's uh, Ryan calling in. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, I had a question for you. Well, first of all, Gary, I think that I'm being a bad influence on Corey. I mean, some of the, some of the suggestions I've, I've had to him in the past about Iowa football are, are coming into fruition. And, and as a matter of fact, I was even putting it in paper in black and white. So I'm getting kind of afraid to call in anymore. And I think I'm, I'm being a bad influence on Corey. So better better back off a little bit i think no, no it's, <laughs> anyway uh, we're not talking about brian tonight but yeah. um but at any rate i was calling gary because i was curious you know after especially after the illinois game um and and here i'm having a moment where i can't remember um but uh you know the chicago bulls used to run this um um uh what do they call that uh i had it on my mind before i called the triple option or uh Triangle. And I was, I was, you know, I was thinking about all the times that um, Perkins had penetrated and kind of went into, you know, making that nifty two that he did in the paint, uh, whether or not the triangle op- offense would work for this group and why you don't see it as much anymore. And that's all I had. Well, I think, um, like a lot of things, I think coaches coaches teach and coach the things that they're the most comfortable with. Um, there was a very effective offense, um, and it's that I think the three point shot now is probably uh, probably hurt that offense as much as as anything. Uh, that now offenses are a little more spread out, um, driving and kicking and things like that to take care of the threes. Um, and, you know, we've seen pretty much all year, I, I was a, is a pretty strong offensive team, one of the best in the country. So I, I think he's very comfortable in what he's teaching. He does a very good job of it. Um, uh, but I would guess um, there's less triangle than before. And I think, I think it's more two things. I think it's one, the three point shot and two coaches comfortable teaching it. Go Hawks says, Corey, is there any correlation for Mark's March success with away games, wins, losses for teams, and player stats for away games versus home stats? Boy, I, I, you might know that, Gary. Is there a correlation with how a team plays and how players play on the road and what they're going to do in March? No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I will say I think a lot of times in March is hopefully you're playing well at that time. Uh, you know, that's why these last few games are important. You want to go in there with confidence. A lot of it's matchups. You know, sometimes you just get a bad matchup. Um, and sometimes it's just flat out luck. I mean, sometimes you just, ball just doesn't bounce your way. Shots don't drop. And that's why they call March Madness. It's one and done. So, you know, a lot of times the best team doesn't advance. Whereas if it were I, a seven game series, they, they, they would. By the way, overall road records in the Big Ten, Iowa's two and five. And you may say, well, Corey, that's terrible. 
You want to know how many teams have a winning record on the road, Gary? I would guess uh, maybe just Purdue. There's actually two. Purdue and how about Northwestern is six and two on That's the road. Right. They won again tonight on the road. Incredible. So my point yeah. is it's hard to win on the road in this conference. Iowa did win against a good Clemson team on a neutral site earlier in the year. Um, you know, they competed really hard against Michigan State on the road, didn't compete as well against Ohio State on the road. We'll see what they do Sunday. They sh- Again, I, I think they should they should take care of business against the uh, Gophers. But, uh, yeah, I don't know that we'd read too much into uh, those numbers. Joe Drish, do we get two buys in Chicago? they got to be top four in the conference. Boy, it's, it's jam-packed there in the middle. It here. is jam-packed there, boy. A couple wins, you go right to the top. A couple losses, you go right to the bottom. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's going to make for an interesting last two, three weeks. Marcus wants to know Fran to Notre Dame. I, I doubt it. That was brought up a few weeks ago. Um, I don't know. He's he's getting older. He's in his 60s now, Gary. No offense. Uh, he's in his 60s. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, uh, I don't think he's probably going to do that. He's got his players playing for him. He's got his youngest son still in high school. But what do I know? Maybe they'll move to uh, – to, uh, South Bend and and he'll finish off his career there. I guess that's always possible. That'd be a blow because you're going to lose Patrick. You're going to lose Jack, who's going to be a Hawkeye. Um, but I, I just don't think that happens. The other thing is, too, they're very close. To, I don't know if this is a big deal, but they're very close to the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. And they were obviously essential in Patrick's uh, medical uh, recovery from cancer. I don't know if that's plays mm-hmm. in their mind. I'm sure Notre Dame has <laughs> some excellent facilities nearby, but uh just your thoughts. Do you have any any thoughts on that idea of Fran and Notre Dame? Well, I think it's logical just because he was an assistant coach there. But no, I I I, I, I would doubt it. But um, but for some for the reasons that you've that you've said, um, but never say never. I mean, this is a crazy crazy deal. But no, I I I I, I don't think that'll happen. And Margaret also played there. That's another reason why you might think that could happen. Jeff says if Fran leaves, Coach Collins of Northwestern will be Iowa's coach. Boy, I, I really like Chris Collins. I know he's got strong connections here. Um, what, what a what a hire that would be. I don't know that it's a slam dunk as much as I like Chris Collins. Yeah, he was on the verge of maybe losing his job after last season, Gary. So they've had a good year, but that would that that hire would make me a little bit nervous. But he would have more available to him here than at Northwestern. No doubt. They, they, they've got some academic uh, restrictions. He, he's, uh, you know, I think him and Payne are probably the two that are a two horse race for coach of the year. He's done a phenomenal job with that, with that team, with what they've lost. I mean, they lost a kid to, to Duke, the other kid to, to um, North Carolina, North Carolina, and they lost the kid that went to Indiana. Um, those yeah, are three good up. players. And now they're, um, they, they, you know they've just won two more games on the road, so they're um, they're they're playing really really well. He's he's done he's a good guy. He's done a great job of of uh, turning that program around this year. Luke says, does Gary Close stay in touch with Coach Pearl? From time to time, yep, yep. I certainly watch his teams play. Uh, they're fun to watch. He's got an interesting team down there. Um, I don't I don't try to bother too many people during the year because I know they're busy, but. A lot of times catch up in the offseason, but I definitely follow his career. He's had a great career. Rick says, in football, we know game plans are key. Coach, in basketball, do you think game plans or scouting reports are more beneficial? Which, I guess, would, would is that a, I guess he's asking which are more beneficial game plans or scouting reports? Well, it's kind of the same thing. No, they're very yeah. important. Yeah, they're, they're very important. I think teams that are well scouted and well prepared, uh, give themselves a better chance to, um, to win games. And that's, um, that was one of the more fun parts of the job. I love doing that and uh, try to figure out teams and where you think they're weak and where their strengths are, what do you got to do to win and lose things like that. So no, they're, they're, they're very important. And, and assistant coaches spent a lot of time on that. All right. Final caller of the night. We're going to have to kind of keep it short. Tony, the tiger. Tony. Thanks, sir. I I first have to uh, ask for your uh, mea culpa and forgiveness. I was not able to call in during the Illinois game post game shows. So. Oh, we were wondering where you were. 
I I got <laughs> lost to I got lost in uh, Hilton because I was at that game live that Iowa State. Oh, game that's right. You said that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was a one heck of a win for the Cyclones. I it was a funny story. I'm sitting there and I just sat in my chair the whole time I was in the upper deck and. I think it was about midway through the second half. This uh, lady tapped me on the shoulder and she's like, you're probably one of the worst Iowa state fans I've ever seen. You haven't got up or did anything. And I was like, well, that's cause I'm an Iowa fan. And I turn around and I have all my Iowa stuff on. So <laughs> it was just kind of funny, but it was, it was a great atmosphere. I, I yeah. enjoyable basketball game for sure. Um, I want to hit on the portal. Uh, you know, you mentioned that with Doug earlier that, uh, that uh, North Dakota State kid is from Devil's Lake, North Dakota, so he is a true North Dakota kid. Um, Jess Settles did that game last night with Wyoming, and they're an interesting case study with the uh, portal. Uh, Wyoming had three, I believe, Pac-12 kids, and all three of them left Wyoming's team before the game last night, like that he announced. So, I mean, you get that, and then you also have the Texas Tech situation where you mentioned uh, – Fardaz, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to, how to pronounce his last name. Amen. Yeah, um, it's not um, all um, I'm trying to think. You know, it's not all great, I guess. You know, but you get all these kids in the portal. Yeah. Um, they met. They mentioned that tonight with Purdue. You know, Purdue didn't go to the portal. You know, they developed Ed, and you know, they have these freshmen. And I think there's more to be said of that. And I, I, I just hope it doesn't turn into portal madness. So three guys from Wyoming left the team tonight? Right. No, right before the game last night. The game that Jess announced last nice. night. So if you want to – yeah, if you want to reach out to him because he was talking about that. I wasn't hoping for a shout-out during that game, but I was just watching it, you know. But uh, he said, like, three guys just left. And they were all from the Pac-12 and transferred into Wyoming, and they just left the program right before the game. I would say those guys are a problem. They they they, they can't seem to be pleased. <laughs> They're yeah, out. yeah. If you've already stay away from them. Well. It does make you wonder, though, Gary, if three of them are leaving at one time, if there's something going on behind the scenes, especially that quickly. Yeah, that that's and during the year, no less. Yeah, I have to, I have to watch that one. Um, well, and what's crazy about that is I don't know if you guys remember Wyoming was an amazing team last year. I think they were like. 29 and four or something it's like good. that. They, the Mountain West they was were, good. We had Colorado State, Boise State. Yeah, yeah they're all, that's a good conference. And then they get those Pac-12 transfers in, and it just, you know, is it a culture fit? Is it whatever? You know, who knows? Um, Lots to get, to you know, up, it's, it's easy to get in trouble. Uh, it's, probably, get, it's probably playing time. And if they weren't getting enough playing time, they're going to look for somewhere else. But, Gary, isn't it easy to get in trouble in the middle of Wyoming? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess probably depending, on what, depending on what trouble you're looking for, I guess. Yeah. Hey, Corey, you want to be careful with that. Um, two stops ago, I lived in the middle of the Montana, so it's pretty similar. We're at Montana. Uh, Great Falls, Montana, right on yeah. the uh, Rocky Mountain front. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, I've uh, um, family family live in Helena and oh yeah, Lane, and I, I love Montana. But I mean, beautiful. It's, I, it's hard to imagine living in a place like uh, well. Uh, areas of Wyoming or Montana that are just completely wide open. Uh, it's incredible, but uh, beautiful land. Uh, two things I had for Coach Close. Um, tonight's game reminded me of that um, Iowa City Regina game where you guys had a Lou Kieda and we were just an undersized 1A school. And <laughs> he was just a, like, he altered every shot. And it's the same thing with Edie tonight. You know, you could see that where um Perkins would drive the lane and it would alter his shot and stuff like that you know having a big body that could eat up that space is just brings back nightmares but uh what uh what plans do you have for the Super Bowl are you going to a party watching it yourself or I'm actually having a few friends over here uh I don't like to go out I like to be in my spot to watch the game and I don't have to be real hospital because I like I like watching the game closely I don't want to be talking and doing a no, no, I'm, I'm watching football. So <laughs> <laughs> and, and the That's, timing of that works perfect because the Iowa games at noon yep, and kickoffs what yep. like well I guess it'd be one o'clock your time and kickoffs what Eastern time or no you're in Wisconsin. I'm sorry. Yeah but Tony he has got his friend he says he only wants to watch the game. He's got his friends coming over two and a half hours early. So we got to be off the air by three. <laughs> I'm serious. 
Oh, I don't. Ooh, I got to watch all the pregame warmups and. Okay, that's what it is. I got to watch the. Oh yeah, there's no. You gotta doubt. watch the stretch. <laughs> I've been alive for 66 years. They've only been in the Super Bowl four times. I'm not blaming you one bit. <laughs> and then, could I close with a question for you, Corey? Sure. I know you've uh, talked about it on Twitter. What are your thoughts, if you want to expose them, on the Mavs trade? Oh God, please! <laughs> oh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I just hope it works. I just hope it works. You know, I just, I just cringe and You're talking I, about a character kid. That's it. That's Kyrie Irving. Good luck. Yeah, I, he's a he's unbelievable. He's unbelievably talented, but I just, you know, I, I just worry to death that he's going to be a distraction. And they gave up. I like Spencer Dinwiddie. I think he's better than people think. Uh, somebody made a comment last night during the Clippers game that. Uh, you know, prior to this trade, Dallas didn't have anybody that could create, you know, when Luca was off the court. That's just false. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, I thought, you know, he he's not Kyrie Irving. He doesn't have the handles that Kyrie has or the passing ability. But uh, Spencer, I mean, Dinwiddie could score from every level. Um, he's not a great defender, but I don't think Kyrie's a great defender. Um, so I, I don't know. They gave up a lot. They gave up their best defender in Finney Smith. They gave up two draft picks, one of which is a first rounder, I think in 25, something like that. And now you heard last night that Kevin Durant is heading to the Suns. So, I mean, last night it looked, they looked good. Didn't have Luka, went on the road and beat the Clippers with Kyrie in his debut. But like I say, he's a head case. And one thing I've always liked about Mark Cuban, and I'm not saying he's the reason why they made this trade. I think Nico Harrison's a big part of what they're doing now, but one reason I've always liked that franchise is they've gotten, I think, good character guys. I'm not saying everybody that's been through there. I mean, Rajon Rondo's had his share of issues, and he played for Dallas during a weird stretch. But for the most part, like Dirk Nowitzki, they're stars. Dirk, Luka Doncic, for the most part, when you are judging them on the sliding scale, they're humble guys. And, boy, Kyrie, from what I know about his reputation, probably not necessarily the most humble. But he also is just kind of a – he's just kind of got some crazy – ideas which that's his right i'm not saying he's right or wrong about certain things that's not for me to judge but i just don't want him to be a distraction and i you know they gave up a they took a big risk the other thing is he he could come here and they bow out in the western conference finals and then he signs with la in the offseason because he's gonna have an opportunity to sign with the lakers which is where he wanted to go the whole time then dallas is okay now we got to go sign someone else and hope we can strike gold again so i go back to jalen brunson they had a chance to sign him early last season and then his stock went way up. They got greedy and tried to sign him for a lower dollar. And boy, he's he was making Gary Jalen Brunson last year when he took Dallas to the Western Conference Finals was making 1.8 million a year. Now mm. he's got to deal with the Knicks for like 25 million. It's incredible. So um, we'll see. I mean, there's a Luca and, and Kyrie at their respective positions are two of the best in the business, Tony. So I hope it works. The one thing I want to close out with uh, my Hilton experience is leaving the games. That's why I'm leaving the podcast here is uh, the traffic direction was awful getting out of Hilton. I really thought I was going to be able to catch at least a little bit of the first half of the Iowa-Illinois game down in Ankeny, and it was awful getting out of that place. And Carver Hoff had an amazing job with, at least when I remember going, like the parking people getting – people out of the lots and stuff like that so i yeah. just wanted to trash i just wanted to trash hilton one last time but. <laughs> so, <laughs> well tony we'll we'll see you guys uh after the hopefully uh 20 plus point uh victory against minnesota and i do agree with you i think five and two is the minimum they go okay with these good. last seven games we'll do it tony thank you sir hey, hold it take that right now yeah thanks Appreciate guys it. All right, great stuff. We went a little overtime, Gary, so I apologize for that. This has uh, been a, a fun show. We've actually had a lot of uh, interaction despite the loss. Sometimes you wonder, uh, given the the result, yeah. if uh, people are going to yeah. be engaged. But appreciate everybody being here and uh, being a part of this show. <laughs> briefly recap the Hawkeyes falling at number one, Purdue, 87-73. It marks just the third loss in 10 games for Iowa dating back to the beginning of January. Hawkeyes had just two players in double figures tonight, Gary. Uh, Philip Rabracha with 17, Chris Murray with 24. Peyton struggled from three. Connor McCaffrey had three air balls from three. Very strange. Uh, that, yeah. that was odd to me. Uh, so the guys didn't play particularly well, and they still had a shot. They were down six late. Um, Hawkeyes did have 22 assists 
which they've surpassed 20 assists in a game for the sixth time this season. They obviously share the ball phenomenally well under Fran McCaffrey. Tonight was the only regular season matchup against Purdue, which is a positive thing. Um, the Hawkeyes made 60% of their field goal attempts in the second half. This second highest shoot, their second hi- highest shooting percentage in a half in a league game this season. They had 64% shot, 64% in the second half against Maryland. Uh, Connor, despite his struggles shooting the ball, had eight assists, game high, eight assists. Patrick collected a game and personal best five steals to go along with nine points, two blocks, two assists, and two rebounds. And I think what you said earlier that was courage. Was absolutely the case. This is this was by far his best performance since he's come back. Yep. This could be a great. This could another be another blessing in disguise to kind of have him. Yeah, we out. could use him. That would be a great addition. Hawkeyes were fifteen of seventeen uh, during a during a from the seventeen minute mark to the eight minute mark in that second half. I mean, they shot the lights out to get back in this game. Um, not necessarily from three, but uh, they uh, they did shoot the ball well in the second half. Hawkeyes had a plus nine turnover margin. The, it's best in a league contest this season. Second best in any game this year. They were plus 18 against North Carolina A&T back in November. And uh, tonight was Iowa's fourth contest of the season against a ranked opponent. They're two and two. Uh, three and 22 all, t- all time against a number one ranked team. So some kind of some some fun stats there for everybody. The Hawkeyes return to play Sunday, Gary, against Mar- uh, Minnesota. I mentioned earlier they're they're by far I think the worst team in the league. Um, is Dawson Garcia healthy right now? You mentioned injuries. That's a good question. I think so, but I I don't know for sure. I think so. Give us some. You've watched Minnesota a little bit. Give us some keys for Iowa to win at the barn. Well, I think just uh, you know just be ready to play and uh, you know play you know take take the positives from this game and. And uh, just just put it to them. Just don't give them any even a thought that they're going to have a chance uh, by playing well at both ends and and uh, you know taking care of business. Be ready to go. All right, folks. Um, I guess I'll throw this up there because we always appreciate Circle Herc's humor. He says your favorite not really a humorous question, but your favorite dessert. What are you eating on uh, Super Bowl Sunday? I know you're going to be watching the game, but uh, you got to have something sweet, right? Or is it a salty thing that? Well, I tell you what, we are doing a potluck. Oh, okay. So somebody's in charge of bringing a dessert, so I don't know what it is. I'll have to tell you down the road. <laughs> we are having, if anybody wants to know, we are having people over as well, approximately 3.30. I don't know why that matters, but we're having people bring stuff as well. Uh, pie is a go-to on Super Bowl uh, evening, for me at least. We're going to have chili, which I think is a... a a go-to with any game day and I'll throw in another plug for our sponsor. Lots of meat. So I've got some lots Iowa of meat. Well, that's, that's appropriate for a football game. All right, folks, Gary, best wishes on Sunday. We're going to, we're going to talk before the yeah. Super Bowl, but of course, yeah. Iowa, Minnesota will be live with you following the game. Get here quickly folks, because we'll be on until about 3 PM central time. So when this game is over, we're going to try to go live as soon as possible to get our show in and hopefully we'll be recapping an Iowa win over the Gophers. Gary, appreciate you taking the time as All always. Right. Yep. See you. See you Sunday. For Coach Gary Close, I'm Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Talk to you Sunday.